it started and when it started. But well, bless you, Park, as we know it, the actual uh, code breaking centre, it all started back in 1938. And um, the then head of the Secret Intelligence Service, Admiral Sinclair, clearly he was head of MI6 and the Government Code and Cipher School, and he knew from what they were listening to over in Germany, because they were intercepting messages even at that time, they knew that there was a possibility of war. And so the last place he wanted to be with the MI6 and the Government Code and Cipher School would be in the centre of London, because they were all located at the Admiralty in those days. So he dispatched people about to try and find some alternative location. And one of his officers, a fellow called Ridley, a captain Ridley, he, uh, he knew of this place. So he uh, reported back, I found Bletchley Park. Oh, why Bletchley Park? Well, it's about 45 miles this side of London. It's on the main Euston railway line out of London. And it's on the, only a mile away from the main A5 or the Watling Street, which was the main north-south road up and down England. And in those days, the main GPO telephone cables ran alongside the A5 or the Watling Street. And there's a booster station for those seats place called Finney Stratford, about five miles away. So this place was ideally situated for all things communication with the city. And the other benefit, of course, coming here, was it was midway between the two leading universities of the day, Oxford and Cambridge, from where it was assumed that the code breakers would come. So Admiral Sinclair bought the place. Um, the, the treasury was slow coming up with the money, so Ab um, Admiral Sinclair bought it himself. He paid seven and a half thousand quid for this place. That's that lovely mansion over there that you will have seen, and 55 acres surrounding it for seven and a half thousand quid. If you look at the records, you'll see that the deeds of this place in those days are in his name. So he clearly owned it. Now we're not quite sure how he got the money. Some say he contributed the whole seven and a half thousand himself. Some say he put six and a half thousand quid of his own money in and managed to scrounge the other thousand from probably the treasury. But the story I like best is it's a story that says he nicked the money from the Navy allocations because in those days he looked after the budgets. So <laughs> I, I like that asking. Anyway, he decided they probably ought to give it a trial run. So MI6 and the Government Code and Cipher School, they, they came up here for a trial run. Uh, Admiral Sinclair even bought his own valet and his own chef to look after them in the mansion. And they came up under the guise of the Captain Ridley shooting party. Now, whether that was to dissuade the locals from divining their real purpose, we don't know. But um, never mind, I don't, I don't really fool any of the locals. Not many people dressed in the way they were. We see some photographs up there around the wall, all nicely attired. Not many people in Bletchley dressed like that in those days, so I don't really fool anybody at all. Anyway, they didn't stay terribly long. Now, they didn't stay terribly long because, as you all know from your history books, uh, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Chamberlain, had his meeting with Adolf Hitler, and he came back here, Mr. Chamberlain got off the aeroplane, waving his piece of paper around, and you'll have seen um, perhaps newsreel slips, um, bit clips of it, proclaiming there would be peace in our time. Yes, yeah. So the whole temperature of the situation subsided and they all troop off back to London. But not for long. Clearly, uh, the government code cipher school were still listening to what is going on in Germany, intercepting the messages, and they realised um, that war was just getting closer and closer. And you remember from your history books that there was a, a non-aggression pact signed between Germany and Russia. That was signed by von Ribbentrop and Molotov. And once that had been signed, uh, it was pretty much on the cards that there would be war with us and Germany. And so by the time war finally was declared in 1939, this place was up and running properly as the government code and cipher school. MI6 didn't come back. Presumably told to shove off and find somewhere else. So it's a rather nice place now, haven't they, by the embankment. If you've seen Skyfall, have you seen it? It's good, isn't it? Uh, um, I think they probably got the better of the bargain, quite frankly. But anyway, so we've now got the government code and cipher school only here and a massive recruitment campaign went on to try and recruit the people here, co-breakers and all the other stuff. But not only the people that were needed, they had to put up buildings like this. 
And if they needed a new one, they just whacked it up. Precious little regard for planning regulations or building regulations. Need another building? You build one. And you'll see over the back, if you walk around later on, some of these buildings are only two feet or less from in distance far. Terrible. You wouldn't get away with it these days. So now we've got the government code cipher school here. So what do they do? Well, they are still listening to what is going on in Germany. They're sending messages to and fro, and now people are intercepting them at what we call Y stations. And in those days, of course, military style messages were all sent by Morse code, and you've seen lots of people sending Morse code with Morse tappers or buzzers, you've seen them. Um, the message comes over the airwaves, and somebody at the other end has a receiver, and they can just listen to what's going on. But unfortunately, of course, anybody in between can listen. So your message is no longer secret, everybody can listen to it, or intercept it, and that's what we were doing. Now the Germans knew we were listening to their messages, but they had a, mes a method of jumbling their messages up. And they used a machine that would encipher the message, so wherever you've got a nice little message on a piece of paper saying, you know, dear Adolf Hitler, we're coming to see you tomorrow, or whatever, you can type that message letter by letter into this machine, and it would tell you some other letters to use in place of the proper letters. And the machine they used is called an Enigma machine. And this is what an Enigma machine looks like. If you've been down to B Block, where you came in this morning and paid, uh, you'll see lots of these in the museum downstairs. This is pretty typical of the type. Um, this is just over life size. Just, yeah, I think it's slightly over life size. And that's a bit under life size. But this is what it looks like. There were different variants, some had four wheels, some didn't have this plug board at the front, and there were other little variations, but this is pretty typical of the sort. Now with this machine, it's got a keyboard like you put on your PC at home or a typewriter, 26 letters only. There they are again. And then there are 26 other letters there. This particular picture shows there's a, a cover that's been put down, and this one, the cover's been lifted out of the way. So you can see the guts of the thing, see what's inside it. So what you've got here is 26 letters, you type in your, your message, it will light up one of these little letters. Every time you push your key down, this will light up. And you'll see what they are there. And they're the ones you send by Morse code. So how does the letter get, or how does the signal get from there to there? Well, the message doesn't send any, it doesn't send, the machine doesn't send any messages. It has a battery so it's self-contained. You push down the key, the signal goes from that key out through one of these sockets on this plug board, stecker board, in to another one via a cable. There are ten cables used at any one time. I'll show you how to use that in a moment. Okay, so the signal comes from there, out, in, up to this first rotor, and those rotors are actually bigger stack, by the way, and you'll see those down the museum. They've got 26 connections on the side. Into this first rotor, through some complicated wiring, and out the other side, into the next rotor, through some complicated wiring, out the other side, into the next one, through the wiring, out the other side, and there's a reflector plate right there, and the signal comes all the way back, out through one of these sockets, and eventually illuminates one of these little bulbs. There are underneath those bulbs, and so on top of those bulbs are the 26 letters of the alphabet. And that is the one that you send by Morse code. And that's taken me a couple of minutes or so to tell you how that works, but it's instantaneous. The moment when you use it in practice, you push down the button and a little light comes up. Do another one, and the light comes up. Now I suspect one or two of you may do the lottery, and you've got an odd pounder to spend. Your chances of winning on the lottery are about 14 million to 1. To set this machine up for the first time, your chances are 158 million. Million. Million to 1. So you've got precious little chance of setting this thing up. So how did the operators know how to set these machines up so that they could talk to each other without anybody intercepting what they were doing? Well, they can intercept it, can't stand it. They have a code book. This is a typical code If I show this lady here, she'll answer your questions later. Um, that's a typical code book sheet. It looks like German, but it's in English. It's in the type, so it looks like German. But that's a typical code book sheet. I'm going to move back now. 
Now, on this particular sheet, both operators would have the same code book. Up the side here, you've got the days of the month, one at the bottom, up to 31. On day one, you use the information on the bottom lines there. At the end of the day, you pack that off and you burn that, so nobody can know what you've used. On day two, you come up one, you use the information, again, cut it off and burn it. So what does it tell the operator? Well, that first column tells him which wheels he is to use. These three wheels on this machine, they come in a box of five. And so that first column tells the operator which three he is to pick and in which position he is to put them. The next column there tells him how he is to set those little wheels. Because each of those rotors, they've got a cunning sprung loaded gadget on the side. You push it in and you can rotate the innards of the wiring relative to the outer shell. So you have to push it in, rotate it around so it comes to a particular position. There's a data mark on each of those. These 10 columns here, they relate to the 10 cables with which the operator connects 20 letters together. They leave the other six under, unconnected. Now there are the variables. Once you set those up, you're nearly there. These last columns merely tell him or her how and where to set these three rotors before you kick off at the beginning of the day. Having set the variables up, you shut the little cover down and you rotate these rotors, these rotors here, there they are, there are three little windows just to the left of each of those rotors once that cover is down. And through those little windows you can see the letters that are around these drums. It's a bit like a combination lock, you just ratchet it round until the particular letter shows through those windows as is defined in that code, that code book. And once you've done that, the two sides can talk to each other. And you do that every day. You change it every day. Now there were a hundred thousand of these things in use during the war, in the Luftwaffe, the Army and the Navy. It was originally invented way back in 1915 um, as, a, as a type of machine. It, was, um, it wasn't until 1923 a chap called Servius came upon it, or developed it, and he came up with an enigma. And it was from there that these things started to take off. When Servius took it over, he wanted to have a machine that banks and finance houses could use to send the confidential and private information between themselves. And he invented this, well he developed this specifically for that run. But it didn't ever take off. It just didn't ever take off. And it wasn't until the early 30s that the German military realised just what the machinist was. And they took the whole thing over, lock, stock and barrel, and developed it further. The original machines only had three wheels, well like this one got, but there were only three. So you could have those in one of six positions, one, two, three, one, three, two, and you can work those out yourself. But when you've got the box of five of these wretched things, from which you choose three in any order, the number of options goes up to 60. And that was complex. It was that extra complexity that started, it stumped the people that were at that time breaking into these. And I'll tell you about that further around now, too. But uh, this thing has an inherent weakness. It was something the Germans didn't originally recognise. And um, I see an interview with a German codebreaker saying, well, Turing recognised this, and we did not. <laughs> and the weakness is that when you press these buttons down, any of these keys, the machine cannot encipher that letter you have pushed down to itself. And that was crucial. So if I press L at the bottom right hand corner here, L or O at the top right, it will never encipher the one here, the one you pushed down. And that was crucial. And I'll tell you about that, which was used later on. Now the other aspect about this machine that makes it so complex is that it constantly changed its wiring. Every time you pushed a key down, anyone, this first rotor would move around. It would travel around one position. There are 26 positions on each. Click, 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 26 times. Push down a key, first rotor moves around with one notch. Push another key down, and it goes around one more notch. 
when it has gone round 26 positions, it makes the next one go round one notch. And when that has gone round 26 positions, it makes the third row tick around one notch. So you can see every time you key in your letters for your messages, the wiring changes every single time. Really, it's a super machine. <laughs> anyway, that's about as much as we're doing here. So you want to gather up your, your umbrella.